So we're going to go through the characteristics of skeletal muscle tissue. Um, there's going to be a few differences for smooth and for cardiac. We'll get to those at the end, but let's talk about these specific characteristics for skeletal muscle tissue. Okay, the nervous system stimulates skeletal muscle. So you're going to have a neuron come and touch a muscle cell and zap it. The neurotransmitter is always acetylcholine for the skeletal muscle system. Now, <clears throat> for excitability, for smooth muscle, and for um, smooth muscle and for cardiac muscle, we're going to have some hormones. And I mentioned, you know, the heart is magic. It has its own cells that actually make, called pacemaker cells, that actually create the electricity to get it going. But skeletal muscle, you're going to have a nerve come touch it, actually a neuron. Neuron come and touch that muscle and stimulate it to contract. And of course, contracting is when the muscle gets shorter. Extension is whenever the muscle uh, is stretched. And then elasticity is the ability for a muscle to snap back to the same length, wash after wash. All right, body movement. So uh, what is the function of skeletal muscle? It's gonna help us, of course, move from point A to point B. And skeletal muscle, you're in charge of that. So one thing you know your mom always taught you to stand up st straight or sit up straight. And this is good to help stabilize the joints. Uh, we constantly have gravity pulling on us. So our muscles are, even when we're not thinking about it, helping us stand up straight. You train your body that way though. If you slouch all the time, your body is not going to make you stand up straight. And then in the end, long term, say 50 years down the road, your back might hurt. So um, believe it or not, when your mom told you to be sit up straight, there's a good reason for it. Okay, our guts. Our guts are protected actually by uh, your muscle. So the more firm and developed your abdominal muscles are, then the better your uh, better protected your GI tract, your liver, your spleen, all those things are protected. Okay, we have um, some areas that we are in charge of. So we have some smooth muscle sphincters and we have some skeletal muscle sphincters. So you met, um, let's say, uh, an area uh, where the stomach got smaller and moved into the duodenum. Well, that's a smooth muscle sphincter that lets small amounts of food from the stomach to the uh, duodenum. Sphincters that we're talking about in the skeletal muscle are the ones that you're in charge of. So this is not a good time to go tinkle. You can go tinkle when you're done listening to this. Well, actually, you're going to be able to pause this. Here's the blessing of doing online thing. You can just, you can stop. I'm tired of listening to Dr. Wiggins. I'm just going to put her on hold. And you can go potty. But let's say you're in class. And it's not ideal for everybody to go in and out, in and out, in and out. You don't want to be that person. So you're going to hold it. You have skeletal muscle sphincters that you can tighten up to hold that urine until it's time to go. And then, of course, the heat production thing that we did before. So, uh, you know, we talked about how when you get cold, your muscles will actually start to shiver and help generate heat. So, what are some highlights uh, about the different kinds of muscle tissue? So, skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle, smooth muscle. Skeletal muscle only zaps through the nervous system. Smooth muscle can be zapped through the nervous system, but we also have hormonal control. And then cardiac muscle, is is all about those um, SA uh, nodal cells, AV nodal cells. You'll learn more about that in AP too. They all use calcium and they all need ATP. The way that the calcium gets into the cell varies between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. And for this class, we're really gonna highlight skeletal muscle and calcium. You'll learn about the other two uh, in more detail, especially the heart in a and 2 Smooth muscle we kind of highlight at the very end, but we really don't do much with smooth muscle. Okay, 
When you look at skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle under a microscope, they have stripes. Uh, so what's happening is you have some proteins called actin and myosin that interact with each other. When they interact, then your muscle can contract, so it can get shorter. The way that they lay down is in parallel lines, and then you're going to have these little uh, anchors. They're called Z-discs. So you can see the striping of these guys under a microscope. With smooth muscle, the actin and myosin are actually kind of laid down like chain link fence, so there is no stripes. The name of this striping is called striations. So uh, there, these cells are striated or striped. Some differences also, skeletal muscle, many, 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 many nuclei. That cell starts at the origin of a muscle and ends at the insertion of a muscle. With smooth muscle, it's just one nuclei. With cardiac, there's one or two. Mitosis, skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle does not go through mitosis. So what makes your, uh, muscles plump up when you get, you know, when you exercise. Well, protein synthesis. You knew there was a reason you had to learn about that, right? So, actin and myosin, those guys that interact with each other, that make the muscle contract, the more you exercise, the more protein synthesis, the more actin and myosin. Skeletal muscle does not go through mitosis. What you have is what you have. But as you grow or as you exercise, you plump that guy up with more proteins, actin and myosin. So they get fatter, like Popeye. The only one you're in charge of is, uh, oh, and then mitosis. Smooth muscle rarely goes through mitosis. But like if you're going to have a baby, you need the smooth muscle of the uterus to get uh, bigger, to grow with that baby's growth. Voluntary, the only one that's voluntary is skeletal. Um, and then I'm going to go through these next slides for location and stuff later. Okay, so here's, here's stripes. You can appreciate, wow, that is, this is one cell. Look at all those nuclei. Do, 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 do. Here's another cell, nuclei, do, 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 another cell. Remember, we've cut through this as a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, so you're going to see the nuclei that are on the outside of the cut. But, you know, as a tube, as a tube, they're everywhere. Cardiac muscle. Uh, these stripes might be a little bit harder to see. You can kind of see them right here, but it is also striated. Um, those cells are actually linked to each other so they have these branches like this and then they have some special things called intercalated discs so these little highlighted pink things is where we have desmosomes that are zippering up those cells making sure that they don't tear apart and gap junctions to make sure that every single cell is getting the same amount of electricity at the same time so you can have lub dub lub dub because we don't want one cell contracting while another is relaxing. Uh, that's fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation. So this lower part of the heart, if that guy starts fibrillating where they're not all getting the same electrical message at the same time, uh, ventricular fibrillation equals death. And then this guy right here is a smooth muscle cell. He kind of looks elongated. He's spindle shape, no striations because his actin and myosin are not laid down parallel. They are laid down in a cross link, cross chain, like a chain link fence. Okay, so the skeletal system, the muscle is the organ. And um, every muscle has thousands upon thousands upon thousands of cells. Uh, it's not wrong to call it a muscle cell, but uh, a, more commonly, it's gonna, that muscle cell is going to be called a muscle fiber because it's a very long cell that starts at the beginning of the muscle and ends at the end of the muscle. Um, 
they'll bundle. So those fibers are going to bundle into something called fascicles. Um, and we'll have a picture in a minute. And let's see. Other things that you'll find in the muscular system, there's going to be like an areolar connective tissue around an entire muscle. Um, we're going to see some blood vessels that are going to pass through fascicles and, of course, nerves because that's what's going to stimulate the muscle. So let's go through those connective con tissue uh, components. Your book goes through the different kinds of connective tissues. Don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of the names of those different um, connective tissue layers and explain to you why they're important. Okay, so around each individual muscle fiber, you're going to have an endomesium. Those muscle fibers are going to bundle into fascicles. Every fascicle is surrounded by a paramecium. And then multiple fascicles put together is the entire muscle. The entire muscle is surrounded by a connective tissue layer called epi. Mesium. Remember, epi on top of, so epimesium around the entire muscle. This is allowing for that whole compartmentalization. Do I need to zap that whole muscle or do I just need to zap one small part of the muscle? So I'll give you an example. Are you picking up a pin? Are you picking up a bowling ball? You still have to contract that muscle to pick it up, but uh, do I need to stimulate that whole muscle? Do I need that much strength? Probably not. So here's that picture. Okay, so here is a muscle fiber. What are these little, this whole thing is a muscle fiber. What are each of these little things? Well, these are the bundlings of the actin and myosin. We'll see those later. Okay, so here's a muscle fiber. This is one muscle cell. This is all the proteins on the inside. This is one muscle cell, and it is surrounded by endomesium. So here we go. Here's a cell. Here's a cell. Here's a cell. Here's a cell. So each of these are cells. Remember these little bundings? I'll tell you about these later, but these are all little bundles of protein. When you put a bunch of these cells together, they're going to bundle into a fascicle. And you can kind of see these when you cut through a steak, right? You can see these little weird bundlings if you eat steak. So those bundles are called fascicles, and the fascicles are wrapped with a paramecium, okay? And then you have all these fascicles together, creating the entire muscle, and then you have a connective tissue layer called epimecium. So here's the cool thing. Each one of these little guys Every single one of them, each one of those little connective tissue endomesiums is going to join with each one of these little paramecians, each one of these paramecians. So the endomesium will meet the paramecium, will meet the epimecium at the end, and it's going to be called a tendon. So a tendon is a combination of each one of these connective tissues of a cell, the endomesium, each one of these connective tissue layers of the fascicle, which is the paramecium, and finally going to join the outside connective tissue layer called the epimecium to go and attach to a bone. Remember, a ligament attaches bone to bone, a tendon attaches muscle to bone. Isn't that cool? Sometimes it's going to have another name, and I'll show you that in just a second. Um, let's see. So the epimecium surrounds the whole skeletal muscle, and um, the paramecium surrounds each fascicle. This area right here, those paramecium's, is where you're going to see some blood supply. I don't know if I can go backwards on this without messing up my recording. <laughs> Probably not, so I better not do that. All right, endomesium um, is going around each muscle cell, which now we're going to call a muscle fiber. 
Okay, here we go. When you put all those connective tissues together, then it's going to come together as a thing called a tendon when it's a cord, which is most of the time. Occasionally, instead of being a cord, it's going to lay out like a really long sheet. When it's laid down like a really long sheet, instead of being called a tendon, it's called an aponeurosis. So here we go. Here's that latissimus dorsi. You've heard of your lats, right? This right here is an entire aponeurosis where this latissimus dorsi is coming and attaching to the vertebrae. So instead of being a cord, now here's a tendon right here. So it's attaching to the, your humerus right here as a tendon, but along your vertebrae, it's going to attach as a sheet. So connective tissues coming together right here is a tendon. Connective tissues coming together right here is an aponeurosis. Quick review right here, anatomy of the knee. Here's a quadriceps muscle, you know your quads. And that tendon actually comes all way down here and attaches at your tibia. Here's a bone living inside of a tendon. What kind of bone is that? Yes, its name is the patella. But from the bone chapter, do you remember what that's called? It's a sesamoid bone. Sesamoid bones live inside of tendons. The patella is the only one that we definitively have for sure in common with everybody else. You have little sesamoid bones on the underneath side of your hands and your feet, but you might, if you're a runner, you might have more than somebody else. Anyway. Okay, so how did that muscle cell end up with so many nuclei? Well, in formation, so embryonically, when you were a fetus and we're putting all this stuff together, we have some stem cells called myoblasts. So they came from the mesoderm and they are going to combine they're going to fuse during development. And as they fuse together and fuse together and fuse together, you end up with this one long cell. So this would be in utero. What's a satellite cell? Okay, so what I'm telling you that skeletal muscle cannot go through mitosis. Cannot go through mitosis. But maybe you have gotten, maybe you have torn some of your muscle. Hopefully not completely. That's bad when you completely tear a muscle. But you get some little microfiber, micro tears in them. We have a cell called a satellite cell. He's a type of stem cell that can help repair muscles. All right, so to confuse A&P students, we're gonna change some names. Let's get into that microanatomy of a cell, the skeletal muscle cell. So now, um, Instead of calling that muscle cell a muscle cell or a myocyte, we're going to call it a muscle fiber. This, the endoplasmic reticulum, instead of calling it the endoplasmic reticulum, oh, sorry, we're going to do cytoplasm. The cytoplasm of a muscle cell, also now called a muscle fiber, the cytoplasm is called sarcoplasm. Um, the cell membrane. So the cell membrane, the part that's wrapped around the entire, where, where we have all those gates that let things in and out of a cell, um, all those proteins that are embedded through the phospholipid bilayer, that wrap around each cell, that cell membrane, is now going to be called sarcolemma. So um, I, I usually do this. So we've got Cell membrane, m -m 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 membrane, lemma, -m 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 lemma, lemma. Two M's, cell membrane, circle lemma. That guy is going to be going all the way down the cell, but he is going to not be, he's going to have these little dips, these little tunnels that are actually going to burrow themselves down through the cell. And we'll, I'll show you a picture of that. Those little areas where the, that cell membrane actually dips down as a tunnel are called transverse tubules. I'm going to show you what their job is. Okay, sometimes I've got some little 
um, uh, prefixes here. So when you see Mayo, when you see MYS, so Miss, and when you see Sarco, those are all referring to muscle. Rhabdo is going to get used for striped muscle, and if you worked at a hospital or uh, physical therapy or anything like that, you might have known somebody, I hope not, that has suffered from rhabdomyolysis, and that's when the muscle starts to die. Very painful. That's a nightmare case right there. So rhabdomyolysis, rhabdomyolysis, lysis to, to come apart. All right, so I told you we've got these little bundlings inside of those cells. You have bundlings of proteins. And I showed them to you on that picture. I'm going to show you some more in a minute. Those little bundlings is proteins of actin and mycin. So actin and mycin are a protein. They're laid down next to each other. They're going to interact with each other to make a cell get shorter to contract. Each cell is going to contract because of these proteins and they get bundled up. Each of these little bundles is called a myofibril. These proteins are filling up that cell. Uh, a muscle cell has all of the components of a cell, but what it's mostly full of is proteins called actin and myosin and mitochondria right? Because mitochondria are making the energy and oh my goodness, a uh, uh, muscle cell needs ATP. Okay, so myofibril are these little bundlings of proteins and they are actually a type of cytoskeleton. They are those little microfilaments that I mentioned in when we talked about the cytoskeleton in the cell. Um, okay, and now instead of calling it endoplasmic reticulum, that smooth ER, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, we're going to give it another name, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we mentioned that one of the jobs of smooth muscle, um, of smooth ER, is to store calcium, specifically in the, in the muscle section. So here we go, you're fixing to see exactly how important that storage of calcium and that release of calcium is inside that cell. All right, here is that individual cell now. Here's all those little bundlings that we have right here. All those little bundlings. Each of these bundlings is a myofibril. These little bundlings are full of actin and myosin. All those guys. This one They've pulled it out so that you can see the little stripes right here are the actin and myosin laying down parallel to each other. Now, what are these dudes? I'm fixing to tell you what those dudes are. But in a nutshell, they're anchors. They are going to be anchors for actin. Anchors for actin. And they're called Z-discs or Z-lines. When you look under a microscope, you have to have a pretty darn good microscope, but I have some great pictures here. We're going to have a dark band right there, and we're going to have uh, we're going to have light bands. So here's a dark band, here's a light band, here's a dark band, here's a light band. That dark band has an A in it. That light band has an I in it. Light, dark. The dark band's name is the A band. The light band's name is the I band. That's their name. But you're going to remember that because there's an I in light and there's an A in dark. All right. So, why do I have to show you all this? From each Z disk to each Z disk, that is the guy that's going to make us contract. It's called a sarcomere. That area from Z-disc to Z-disc is called a sarcomere. And you have thousands of sarcomeres per myofibril, depending on the length of the muscle. But let's just do, uh, let's say biceps. Your biceps is starting up at your shoulder. It's finishing on your radius. 
that's a long muscle. We, just, we have longer ones, right? Your quads. But that's a, if on a microscopic level, that's thousands of sarcomeres. So what's inside of those little sarcomeres that are making us contract our muscle? We have those actin and myosin that I already told you about. And then we have a couple of extra little dudes that you're fixing to meet. Troponin and tropomyosin. And then, of course, those Z-discs Z -discs that are anchoring the actin. A for anchoring, A for actin. Anchoring the actin. So here we go. Now, on that other picture, it was a microscopic picture, so you it just looked like a line, a straight perpendicular line. But this is a Z-disc, and this is a Z-disc. So from here to here is a sarcomere. Don't worry about this H zone. Um, we have a couple of things. There's an M line. There's an H zone. Don't worry about that for me, that and that. Don't worry about that. But I'm going to tell you that these darker lines right here are the myosin, and these thinner lines are actin. This is how they lay down with each other. That actin is anchored at the Z-disc. So you have thousands of sarcomeres per, um, per myofibril. So here's one sarcomere. There's another one that's going to keep going here, going to keep going. Same thing on this side. It's going to keep going. So let's just focus on this one little Z-disc right here, to Z-disc to Z-disc, this one sarcomere. Okay. So you're going to have a center, and then you have ends. All right. This is how these guys line up. So these myosin is a thick filament. So that's why he's drawn as a fat red line. Actin is thin. And so he's drawn as a skinnier line like this. Okay, so what exactly uh, is that myosin? Well, it's a pretty cool looking uh, protein. If you've ever been a National Geographic lover, or you like um, shows that are uh, uh, natural, this is what snakes look like when they're making new snakes. Okay, they intertwine with each other and they, their little heads are right next to each other. What this is doing is creating a strong cord and then these guys are going to cord up together. This whole thing right here is a myosin filament. There's some little things right here that are highlighted, and these are actually um, going to be binding sites for certain things. So I told you that actin and myosin are going to interact with each other to contract. So what's going to happen is when it's time, we're going to have actin come in or myosin go and bind to actin right here but what do we need all of this to happen we need atp so we also have to have an atp binding site so each of these little heads has a site to bind to actin and has a site to bind to atp here's that actin this looks like a twisted string of pearls but it has an accessory unit so here's the string of pearls. All of this is actin. And look, these little pearls have a divot right here. There's little holes. And the way that this picture is drawing it is showing another molecule that's kind of covering up the holes. Okay. These little holes are binding sites for actin, um, for myosin, sorry. So that little snake head that I said it has an actin binding site, well, this little actin has a myosin binding site. So that snake head wants to be right here. But we don't always want to stay in a contraction. So sometimes we're going to cover the binding site up with this little string right here. This string that's covering the binding site so that myosin can't always stay attached to it, this is called tropomyosin. And this tropomyosin string has another extremely important molecule right here. This guy is called troponin. If you've worked in a cardiac ward, you've heard of troponin before. 
Now we're talking about skeletal muscle right here, but I'll get into troponin's importance in just a second. Tropomyosin, that's the string that's covering the myosin binding sites. So when your muscle is at rest, when it's not contracting, it's covered up. That binding site is covered up by the string. Troponin is a globular protein. So quaternary, you remember that term where it's a big old wad? This would be a secondary protein because it's like a string. Remember all that? Oh my gosh, why did I have to learn that? Aw, oh, dang it. That's okay. I'll continue right here. Okay, so troponin, his job is to, he's got this little binding site right here for calcium. So do you remember, here's, here's a muscle cell right here. Here's little bundles of actin and myosin and some other things, right, that I've mentioned. Compartmentalized proteins. Look what's wrapping around it. All that purple stuff is the smooth ER. And what is the smooth ER storing? The smooth ER is storing calcium so that at the right time, when a nerve zaps this muscle and says it's time to contract, this guy right here, the smooth ER, is going to get the message, let go of your calcium. And when he lets go of it, now that calcium's floating around, woo, inside this muscle cell, and what's gonna, where's it going to go? He's going to go find this calcium binding site. It's going to bind onto the troponin. See right here? calcium binding site. Well, guess what happens? It's like putting a quarter into a turnstile. I don't know, some of y'all are probably too young to know what I'm talking about. When you went to Disney World or whatever, you put a quarter in the turnstile so that you could walk through the turn so that you could get into the park. So here we go. When you put a calcium on top of this troponin, this tropomyosin, when stuff binds to stuff, stuff changes shape. When this guy changes his shape, the string moves off of those binding sites. And now that you've had the calcium come bind to the troponin, because the nerve said so, time to contract. Nerve zaps this muscle, which tells the smooth ER, which now we're going to call sarcoplasmic reticulum, he lets go of his calcium. Now it's free floating inside this muscle. It's going to go find these troponin binding, the binding. All right, this slide right here has sarcolemma, so cell membrane, and they peeled it back away. So I told you that the sarcolemma is actually going to tunnel down into the cell. Okay? So see, here's showing a picture. Here's the muscle. Pull out a fascicle. Pull out an individual cell. Here's the individual cell. Sarcolemma peeling it up. And these little holes are the tunnels. Continuous with this hole has been cut away from here. This is the tunnel going down. So this green right here is the tunnel called a transverse tubule. This purple right here, all this purpley, bluish purple, all that, is the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the smooth ER, sarcoplasmic reticulum, that's holding the calcium. Well, a nerve is going to come and touch this muscle and zap it. It's like, I need you to contract. And what's going to happen is, as that passes down that cell membrane, remember the cell membrane is where those channels are, those proteins, and they, there's all kinds of proteins. Some of them are voltage-gated. The nervous system is electrical, and that electricity is going to pass down through this tunnel down to here. And look, what's butted up against that T-tubule is the sarcoplasmic reticulum that's holding the calcium. That's how he's going to get the message. That's how that, dang it, electricity is going to go down into that cell. That's okay. Uh, we'll see it again in a second. All right, so I already showed you the different regions of that sarcomere. So there's dark bands and light bands. The dark band, D-A-R-K, is the A band. And that is going to be um, dark under the microscope. I'll show you in a picture what it looks like um, on a sarcomere in more detail 
so it's easy to show you with the picture. I can't go back or I'll lose the recording. Eye band is going to be L I G H T light eye band. It's going to be light in color. He's light because he is only actin. Actin is thin. Because he is thin, the light p passes through it easier. And so it's light in color. If something's thick, the light can't pass through it under a microscope, so it's dark. So those A bands and all I, I bands are what's going to create the stripes, the striations under the microscope. So here we go. Here is dark. Here is light. There's a weird thing. What's this dark line passing through the through the I band? It's actually the Z disc. The Z disc anchors the actin. So I'll show you a picture in a minute. The the purple is nuclei. This little strand right here is actually the endomesium, so the wrap around each cell. So this is a cell, this is a cell. Okay, here we go. So we've got, this is the setup of a sarcomere. So here's the Z disc or Z line. You might see it written as Z line, whatever. Here's the Z disc right here. Here's those little beads. That, those beads are the actin, and you can see the tropomyosin and the troponin on that. So here's actin, here's actin, anchored to the Z-disc, anchored to the Z-disc. This is moving on to the next sarcomere, and it's cut off. This is moving on to the next sarcomere, this is cut off. This is, if you could imagine, this just keeps going, this would be the cell, okay? And you've got thousands of these guys in here, okay. Here's the myosin. Myosin is thick. All those little snake heads coming off of it. Remember, there's an actin binding site that would love to get a hold of this little bead right here on the myosin binding site. When he does that, when he gets grabs it, he's going to pull that towards the middle. Pull this towards the middle. And can you see if those get pulled towards the middle, the actin is getting pulled towards the middle. This is going to get shorter. This is going to get shorter because that's going to get pulled to the middle too. That's a contraction. Here's another setup. So we've got Z disc to Z disc. This whole thing is a sarcomere. Here's another picture. When the muscle is relaxed, this is what the actin and myosin is set up at. So they're overlapping each other, but there's a big gap right here. We're all relaxed. This is all actin. This is the I band. This is the I band. And so what's going to happen is when that calcium shows up and the troponin moves, so the tropomyosin moves, and then this myosin can come and grab this, it's going to pull it towards the middle. Here we go. Pulling towards the middle. Look what happens. That muscle got shorter. And look what also happened. Those I bands that were all right in here, because it's just actin, it's light, it's thin. Actin is thin, so the light passes through it. Well, when you bring those Z discs towards the middle, you don't have an I band anymore because they're all overlapping now. So the I band disappears in a fully contracted muscle. Oh my goodness, here we go, neuromuscular junction. The neuromuscular junction, neuro nervous system, muscular muscle, junction where something meets. Very long word, very simple meaning, where the nerve and the muscle meets. Every muscle fiber is innervated by a neuron. Every muscle fiber can get zapped by a neuron. Remember, a neuron is an individual cell. You put a whole bunch of neurons together, and then you're going to have a nerve. A neuron is the individual cell. Usually the ends of that neuron, so the ends of the axon, the axon terminal, is going to touch in the middle of a muscle fiber. And it has certain anatomical things I'm going to explain to you. The end of the axon terminal, sometimes it's called the synaptic knob. Um, where it meets the muscle, that's the motor end plate, 
then the space between the two is the cleft. I'll show you a picture in a little bit. All right, these nerves are going to be somatic ner motor neurons. So somatic part of the system uh, that we're, we're, we're moving inside the body, motor moving. That axon is coming off of the cell body and transmitting the electrical message. So the electricity starts at the cell body and it's going to zoom on down an axon and at the very end it's going to touch the muscle. That's going to be the neuromuscular junction. So here's a picture. Here's that axon. You can't see this, the body because the body is going to be up here in the spinal cord. But that axon is going to come down here and look. It's going to have these little splayed areas where it can go and touch. These are each individual cells where that neuron meets that muscle fiber. That is going to be a neuromuscular junction. Okay, so here's that axon coming down, going into separate little axon terminals right here. And this is where it's touching those muscle cells. This is a blown up right here. So here is that axon terminal, also called a synaptic knob, where it's touching the muscle fiber. This area right here, where they are at that gap between the two, because these are, these, I say they're touching. There's actually the tiniest little partial gap you know, one millionth of a millimeter, I don't know, it's tiny. That gap is called a synaptic cleft. This area where we have this increased surface area along the muscle cell right there, that's called the muscle, the motor end plate. Motor neurons have long axons, so that motor neuron is originating at the spinal cord getting the message from the brain, hey, I want you to move my muscle. So that axon leaves the spinal cord and courses as long as it needs to go. So let's say you want to wiggle your big toe. That axon is going to leave the spinal cord. So cell body inside your spinal cord. Important to know this for neurology. So when we get into the nervous system, you need to already know this. That motor neuron, so motor neuron means it's going to move something. Motor, not sensory neuron, sense, motor. This motor neuron is originating in the spinal cord. The axon leaves, and it goes all the way down to your big toe. That is a stinking long cell. I mean, for somebody like Shaquille O'Neal, how long is that? Good grief. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. So that axon finally meets the muscle of your big toe to help you wiggle. And he is going to meet at the neuromuscular junction and he releases his neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter's name is acetylcholine. All of your skeletal muscles get stimulated to contract by the beginnings of acetylcholine. So what happens is at the nerve side, what calcium is going to enter into the synaptic knob, the axon terminal, synaptic knob, also called synaptic bulb. Why is there so many names? I don't know. I'm not in charge. So when that neuron sends down that signal from the cell body of the neuron all the way down the axon, when it gets to the bottom of the axon, calcium is going to come into that synaptic knob. When calcium comes into that synaptic knob, that tells the uh, acetylcholine, it's time to get going. I need to leave that nerve and go stimulate something. So it does. When the calcium comes into the neuron, the acetylcholine gets the message, it's time for me to leave. He is actually going to exocytose out of that neuron through the synaptic cleft, and he's going to go find a receiver 
on the motor end plate. So here we go with that chapter three again. Those There's going to be proteins stuck in the cell membrane of the, of the muscle. So the receivers are going to grab a hold of that acetylcholine and open up a gate. So on the motor end plate, you have these protein channels that have acetylcholine receptors. The acetylcholine binds to this acetylcholine receptors. So the acetylcholine is a ligand. That's its name because he's the key to the gate. When that acetylcholine binds to the receptor, the gate opens. Now let me tell you, acetylcholine has no desire to go into that muscle cell. It's sodium. Remember, so is, sodium is high in concentration outside of the cell. Potassium is high on the inside of the cell. So we're going to have diffusion moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Sodium now gets to enter into the muscle cell because acetylcholine opened up the gate. So sodium moves from high concentration to low concentration pretty quickly. Some potassium leaves, but you'll learn that potassium has a tendency to be, tendency to be a little bit of a slow poke. Sodium usually, not always, sodium is usually is pretty quick rushing in. So that negative 70 is meeting a whole bunch of sodium positives, and we're leaving our negative 70 moving towards zero. That's called depolarization. You're trying to get rid of that difference, and we're creating electricity. Okay, so a close-up of that neuromuscular junction. Here's the neuron, here's the muscle, here is the motor end plate with the increased surface area. So you can see phospholipid bilayer, there's little protein channels, and then up here, this is the membrane of the cell membrane of the neuron with some different kinds of proteins. We're going to focus on this one. Because the brain wants to move, that muscle, we're going to have a signal, an electrical signal, come channeling down here, which is going to open up these protein uh, gates. So <clears throat> calcium is actually going to diffuse in. Once it gets a message to open, calcium is going to come in. When calcium comes in, it tells these little packages of acetylcholine, they're just little proteins that have been synthesized, protein synthesis made acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, and they've been packaged by the Golgi apparatus, and they're all bundled up. Calcium comes in and says, time for you, acetylcholine, to come and make a muscle contract. So off it goes, it fuses with that cell membrane, exocytosing, and here, as it exocytosis, there goes that vacuole exocytosing. Acetylcholine is now in the synaptic cleft. It's going to go and find these very specific ligand-gated channels. So what's going to open that channel is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the key to the gate. Acetylcholine is the ligand. And remember, sodium is high on the outside of a cell, low on the inside. So when that channel opens up, sodium is going to diffuse into that muscle cell. Yes, potassium is going to leave slowly, but this is the biggie. When the sodium, these little purple dudes, come in here, they're positively charged. So that negative 70 is become, uh, going to become less negative because sodium is positively charged. All right. So what happens then? You get all of this sodium coming in. You're changing this charge of negative 70 towards zero. If it is enough of a zap, if it hits a certain number, that electrical signal is going to continue down the inside of that neuro, uh, of that sarcolemma like dominoes. What's not pictured here is, this is still cell membrane, 
there's still gate, 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 all the way down. And remember that sarcolemma lemma is going to dip down into the cell. Gate, 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 gate. gate. So when that sodium comes in, he's changing that negative 70 to something more positive. Sometimes there's diseases that are actually going to mess with that ligand-gated channel. Sometimes what happens, this is an example of one, myasthenia gravis is a disease where you have a shortage of the acetylcholine receptor. So those gates that are on the motor end plate, they can't receive the acetylcholine. If acetylcholine can't open up the gate, guess what? You're not going to be able to contract a muscle. So because they're not lacking, they're just, there's a shortage of them. These people are weak. They're not completely paralyzed, but they're weak. Now, there are some poisons like, say, the cobra poison that's going to mess at the neuromuscular junction. That causes paralysis and death. But this example, myasthenia gravis, is actually um, going to make the person weak because they do have some receptors, just not very many. So here's that term, action potential. What is an action potential? If you get negative, sev negative 70 to a threshold number, then we're going to continue the zap, that electrical signal, down the sarcolemma so down the cell membrane and continue to open voltage-gated channels. When those channels open, remember sodium is going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration and continue that um, opening of a gate, opening of a gate, opening of a gate. So here we go. Remember I said there's going to be more gates. More gates. So... The calcium came into the neuron, which told the acetylcholine to leave. The acetylcholine goes and finds these ligand-gated receptors, so the gate opens, so now sodium comes in. Let's go over to here. So we have, we have gotten uh, lots of sodium right here, and then we're going to start with some new kind of gates. These aren't the ligand-gated ones for acetylcholine. These are voltage-gated ones. So he recognizes that, wow, all this sodium has come in here. I am changing my charge, the voltage of this cell membrane. And so when this guy gets that message, he's voltage gated, he's going to open up. And he's going to let in more sodium. And then we're going to have another guy that's, that looks just like that. And he's going to let in more sodium. And it's going to keep going like dominoes. That action potential, that zap. That's what I call an action potential, is going to keep going. Why is he showing us this potassium channel? Well, that guy is going to open up too to let potassium out because you don't want to stay in a constant zap state. You want to, you want to end up going back to negative 70. So right here is showing how you are going to uh, repolarize, get back to negative 70, slowly that potassium is going to leave and this area is going to go back to negative 70. But that's okay because the electricity is going down into the cell. It's going to go find that, uh, that smooth ER, that sarcoplasmic, endo, sarcoplasmic reticulum to let out the calcium because the zap has, tra has traveled. Oh my gosh, Dr. Wiggins, what are you doing to us? Okay, so <clears throat> this is a picture that I pulled actually from the neuro section. So ignore this little negative 90, whatever. But this is describing an action potential. The action potential that is changing a charge going towards zero. So I'm depolarizing. I'm getting rid of that negative 70 and coming up here. This is when sodium is rushing in. Look how high this is. This one has a little bit more of a slope because potassium is a little bit slower. So I'm zapping that 
zapping that muscle to, uh, to propagate that action potential and get down to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is just one point in time. It's going to continue down that cell membrane, though. It's going to keep happening. So you're going to have in this particular place in the cell, it's going to create this, but those little spikes are going to keep happening as they go down that cell membrane. So again, I call an action potential a zap. A lot of times I'll just say, we're going to zap that cell. That's an action potential where we're depolarizing. We're leaving negative 70 and going towards zero. And then when the body is going to fix it, we got to get it back to negative 70. So as we get it back to negative 70, that's repolarization. And the reason that that action potential can go deep into the cell is because of those T-tubules I told you about. That cell membrane dips down into the cell. And cell membranes have those channels. So we're going to keep opening those voltage-gated channels so that sodium keeps rushing in. Those um, T-tubules are going to butt up right up against this um, sarcoplasmic reticulum where they so here's those T-tubules dipping on down. Here's sarcoplasmic reticulum. Where they butt up to get together like this, the ends where they're kind of bubbled out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, that's called a terminal cisternae. It's like a big old pocket. So that electrical wave is going to pass down through here. And of course, we're going to have a connection between here and here. We're going to have another gate between this guy's uh, cell membrane and this guy's cell membrane so that he can get the message. I have a zap that is traveling. I had a neuromuscular junction over here. Zap, 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 zap. When it gets down to here, then this guy got the message and he is going to open up his gates and let out calcium. Let out some calcium. That calcium is going to leave that sarcoplasmic reticulum, now it's free-floating inside of the muscle cell. Who does he want? He wants to go find that troponin. Remember that little globular molecule that was sitting on top of the thread? The thread was tropomyosin. The tropomyosin was covering up the binding sites on the actin, the little set of pearls. Remember all that? Boom. Here comes that release of calcium. That, re that calcium is going to go find all of those little bundles of proteins. And look, that calcium is going to find the troponin. The tropomyosin is going to move off of its binding sites. See, it's covering the binding sites right here. Now they're not covered. And who would love to get a hold of that? This myosin right here. He's going to bind to that and pull that actin towards the middle, which causes a contraction. It's got a fancy name. You excited the muscle with the zap that causes a contraction. Why do we do that? I don't know. That's what it's, it's, it's a whole bunch of words to describe. I zapped a muscle cell so it could contract. Excitation contraction coupling. So, first the calcium binds to the troponin. When stuff binds to stuff, they change shape. So the tropomyosin moves off of the binding sites on the actin so that myosin can now grab a hold of the actin and pull on the actin towards the middle. When that myosin binds to the actin, actin that has a name, it's called cross bridging. I don't know why. It just does. So when the myosin is linked up to the actin, it's got a fancy name called a cross bridge. And then when the myosin pulls on the actin towards the middle of the sarcomere, that's called a power stroke. It's going to do it over and over and over again until you're done contracting. Remember those videos that I told you that are in Lanyap that you must watch over and over and over again? Here they are. This physiology is the most complicated physiology, not because it's hard, but because there's so many tiny steps. You have to understand the microanatomy, and then you have to understand why was it made that way? Form fits function. It was made like that for a reason. 
There's multiple videos over muscle contraction. You must watch them over and over and over again. Uh, there is also one on a uh, crash course where um, Hank does muscle contraction. That's usually how that, well, that is how he ends the video. And he'll say, just like you have to watch this video over and over again to understand the sliding filament theory or something like that. Okay, so tropomyosin covering up those binding sites on those pearls. Troponin is the globular molecule. It's all covered up. We are relaxed. Calcium shows up and binds onto that troponin. When stuff binds to stuff, things change shape. So the tropomyosin moves off of those binding sites. The myosin that's laying close by can now bind to the bind to the actin and he can pull it. This slide is talking about ATP. Do you remember I said that there was an ATP binding site also? not just an actin binding site on that myosin, there's ATP. So what happens is inside this myosin head, there's something called ATPase. So when ATP, I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna start right here, binding of ATP causes the myosin head to return to its resting position. So ATP is going to go to the binding site it's very quickly going to break down into ADP and the phosphorus that got released. So a adenosine diphosphate, here's the tri right here. It's all broken up. Remember when you break bonds, you release energy. But that myosin head is going to store that energy until it's time to grab a hold of that actin. Once he actually does get to grab a hold of that actin, and pull on it, there you go, power stroke, he releases the ADP and that third phosphorus, which allows for the ATP binding site to be open again and another ATP shows up. Whenever that other ATP shows up, whenever the next, so he releases ADP and the third, third phosphorus, whenever ATP shows up, that makes the myosin go back makes the myosin go back to the quote-unquote cocked position. So if you want to fire a gun, and it's, this, and it's that kind of pistol that you have to lower the trigger to be ready, that's exactly what's happening right here. ATP is going to come to that naked binding site, and when he does that, it makes that myosin let go. And that myosin head's going to break it down to ADP and phosphorus ready for the next time he can grab the actin. But as long as there's calcium ions floating around in that uh, sarcoplasm, then that myosin is gonna keep grabbing, keep pulling, keep grabbing, keep pulling, keep grabbing, keep pulling, keep grabbing, keep pulling. You get the idea. So let's say that the action potential has stopped. You don't need to contract it, so your brain says, okay, that's enough contracting. Thank you very much. Oh, this is about the, I think it's about the ATP. This is really important, that's why it's bolded. ATP attaches to the myosin head, causing the head to detach from actin. So once, once it attaches, that makes the myosin head let go and go back down to that cocked position. Okay, what stops a muscle contraction? The neuron stops firing, so the brain says, okay, enough contracting, I wanna relax that muscle. We have an enzyme that lives inside that synapse, so the gap between the neuron and the motor end plate, and it's nicely called acetylcholinesterase. So acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine. So, if you don't have acetylcholine opening up the gate, letting in sodium, then the, the zapping has stopped. Any extra calcium that's floating around and there's no zap that's saying, I need you to be working, is going to get pumped back. So an active process, pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
for the next time. There is a slight period of time where a muscle cannot be re-stimulated. That's called a refractory period. We'll get to that later. Okay, so no more zapping. No more zapping. And uh, the calcium is going to get resorbed. Uh, remember that ATP has uh, bound to it and that myosin is back in the cocked position, but without the calcium, that tropomyosin is going to go back to its original position. So calcium gets pulled off, pumped back into the endoplasmic reticulum, to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the calcium leaves the troponin, so that when stuff binds to stuff, things change shape, or when something unbinds, things change shape. And that tropomyosin is going to go and cover that actin site again. So it's covered. So he's going to stay. I'm ready. I'm waiting. I have stored some energy inside this myosin head. I have a little ADP in the phosphorus, and I'm waiting. But it's done, so it's going to relax. Rigor mortis. Why do we get stiff when we're dead? ATP makes myosin let go. If you're dead, you don't have any ATP. So that myosin head can't go back down to the cocked position. It's, it's pulled the actin tight, and that's it. Now, after time, proteins break down. So rigor mortis stops because the actin and the myosin and the tropomyosin and the troponin are all going to start to decay into tinier molecules. And that's why the cross bridging releases and essentially you start to rot for ni no, no nicer way to say it. Okay, troponin. I mentioned that maybe if you've worked in a place uh, that you know does hearts, you've heard of troponin before. There's different kinds of troponin. So cardiac troponin is actually different from um, uh, skeletal muscle troponin. There's, there's, there's several. But when you have a heart attack, or when somebody thinks you've had a heart attack, they're going to measure your cardiac troponin when you get there, and they're probably going to keep pulling blood and seeing if that troponin level is going up. If you have heart muscle cells, so cardiomyocytes dying, then the cell is going to just crumble apart. If that cell is crumbling apart, then all those little factors are going to get released into the bloodstream, including troponin. So cell dies, things just to start get taken back up into the bloodstream. If you've had a heart attack initially, your troponin levels might be slightly elevated with time as those cells continue to die because you lost blood supply to that section of the heart, that you're, you're going to get more and more elevation of your troponin levels, your cardiac troponin. So that's one way you can diagnose a heart attack. Troponin is a very common test for heart attack victims or potential heart attack victims to prove. All right, I know that's a lot of information, um, but uh, it's just repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, do those videos over and over and over again so you understand the anatomy, so you can understand the physiology. All right, so where in the world does that ATP come from? This is the biggie, aerobic respiration. And you actually already knew that. I don't know if you knew the name. Aerobic respiration happens in the mitochondria. There's lots of details to it, and you don't need to know all those details right now. You'll learn it in AMP2, but with oxygen and with glucose, there's glucose, there's oxygen. We're going to take that into the mitochondria, and the mitochondria is going to make carbon dioxide and water as waste products, but ATP. Approximately 36 ATPs per sugar molecule. So 95% of our ATP comes from the mitochondria. There's other ways, though. We have a molecule called creatine phosphate that is inside of our skeletal muscles. And very quickly, we can take that uh, creatine phosphate and donate the phosphate to an ADP molecule. 
and then you have ATP, so you have creatine. If you are a baseball player and you are swinging at a fastball, you're using direct phosphorylation. I am still, and now I'm swinging at a 100 mile an hour ball. You don't need a lot of energy, but you sure need it right this very second. That's gonna be from direct phosphorylation. Anaerobic is actually the breakdown of glucose in the cytoplasm. So initially when glucose goes into a cell, it gets broken into some two pyruvate molecules. You get two ATPs out of the deal. So not efficient. Um, this is going to be uh, for short, intense exercises. So maybe you run the 200 meter. You're probably using anaerobic. Aerobic is going to be things that are a little bit longer than that. Most of our ATP is coming from aerobic respiration. Here's a picture. So here's that anaerobic that I was just talking, 200 meter sprint. If that's you, well, there you go. You're getting a lot of your ATP2 per glucose from uh, inside the, not the mitochondria. You know, it doesn't mean you don't have oxygen available. It just means that these two ATPs are generated from uh, without the youth, without the help of oxygen. This guy though, is where you're going to sometimes get lactic acid as a byproduct. And so therefore, that's where you get some tender muscles. That's actually, it's kind of argued as to is all muscle soreness from lactic acid buildup. Um, I don't know why we have to argue about things like that. But anyway, we know that lactic acid, acid inside the muscle is going to cause some discomfort. So... Okay, so if you have some sort of, maybe you're a marathon runner, that's an endurance exercise, right? I mean, not everybody can be a ma marathon runner. So that can be moderate activity that goes for a long time. You are gonna use the ATP from the mitochondria. Anaerobic, you can get it pretty darn fast um, from uh, the anaerobic pathway, which is also called glycolysis. I forgot to point that out, but you're going to wear out. You can't keep doing 200 meter sprints every five minutes. And anybody that's done one knows exactly what I'm talking about. You'd probably be vomiting. It's just, it's not enough ATP. All right, we have a cool molecule inside of our muscles that's only in our muscles. It's called myoglobin. This guy, um, he holds on to oxygen tighter than the hemoglobin. Um, he can only carry one oxygen molecule, but he offers a little additional oxygen to help that mitochondria out. There's a lot that we have to learn um, about this molecule still. But um, I think I mentioned at the beginning where I talked about myo and mis and rhabdo are all about muscles. Well, my, rhabdo is specifically skeletal muscles. But when you start to break down skeletal muscle, that's called rhabdomyolysis. If you've ever met anybody, or for me, I've seen dogs, of course, bitten by a uh, rattlesnake. Rattlesnake venom destroys muscle. And... Um, it is very, man, it's textbook. You know when you see a dog that's been bitten by a rattlesnake. Of course, there's the two holes, but the dogs actually continuously, and people continuously leak this uh, brownish-red fluid that does not clot. It's interesting and cool and gross at the same time. The skin actually kind of looks like a peeling sunburn. It just is just rotting away and it's just it looks like a sunburn that you could peel away that's from destruction of myoglobin what's muscle fatigue well you absolutely positively cannot contract that muscle anymore i tell you what if you've been grocery shopping and you've had a whole bunch of bags and you're like i can get this i can carry all of these and then you're almost to the door 
and you drop because you were silly and you knew better, right? How many times have we done that? <laughs> That's muscle fatigue. You're contracting and contracting and you're contracting and your muscles start to shake. And you're like, oh my gosh, get the door open. And then you drop all your groceries. So that's muscle fatigue. You have used up as, as much ATP as your muscles will allow you to. You don't want to use it all up, you'll die. Um, building up too much of a waste product like lactic acid, which is going to lower the pH, making your muscles too acidic, and your body says, stop. Stop doing that, silly. Just take two grocery bags. You don't need to take all eight grocery bags. Okay. Oxygen debt. So you go for a run. Let's say you go for a mile run. And you need the oxygen for the aerobic pathway. Okay. Well, when you're done running, you have used so much oxygen to contract those muscles you know some of your other cells would like some of that oxygen too. So really to replace that oxygen that you have lost, that oxygen debt, to make sure that all your other cells are happy too, <laughs> you're panting. You're trying to get in as much exercise as possible. It's also called post-exercise oxygen consumption. So we're trying to make sure that every cell has all the oxygen that it needs, so you're going to pant. That's called oxygen debt. Another term, muscle tension. That's the force generated by the contraction of a muscle. So how strong are you? And I hate to say it, girls, but boys are stronger than, than girls because boys have more um, muscle than we do. They just, it's genetic. It has to do with testosterone. Sorry, some girls, uh, I can think of a couple that are probably fussing at me in my head. Some girls exercise, and they're much tougher than some boys that don't exercise. But boys, genetically, males have more muscle. So how strong are you? Muscle tension. How much, how much strength can you get behind that contraction? All right, sometimes you move things, sometimes you don't. You've heard of planking. That's a non-movable con contraction. You're not moving anything. You're just holding yourself in place. But you know what I'm talking about. If you have planked... And you're just you're just in that position and you feel the tightening of your muscle the contraction of the muscle it's a type of a type of uh, contraction called isometric you're not moving anything but uh, you for sure are getting some tension inside that muscle most of the time we're doing a little bit of both okay so isotonic contractions are when we actually are moving a load so uh, when you shorten a muscle, that is a type of isotonic contraction called concentric. When you are lengthening a muscle, that is a type of isotonic contraction called eccentric. So these pictures right here, you pick up that barbell, this contraction right here, shortening of the muscle. But, you know, you don't just plop that barbell down. You slowly go back down. So when you're slowly going back down, you can still feel the tension in your muscle, right? Especially when you're on, like, rep number 30. It's tight. You can feel it. And, of course, you can see it on the other side. Whatever the, whatever the biceps is doing, the triceps is doing the opposite. Still a concentric and eccentric contraction, but opposite names because the triceps is doing the opposite of the bicep. And then isometric, like I said, you're still getting tension. But if you're doing like leaning up against a wall, you can feel yourself tensing. Or if you're doing the squat, so your back is flat against the wall, but your legs that are a 90 degree angle, you're not moving. You're not going to move the wall. But your thighs are going to start to shake. Yes, mine do. That's isometric contractions, not isotonic contractions. Isometric. Okay, remember our skeletal muscles do not go through mitosis. So the number of muscle fibers don't change. So how do we get stronger? The more you exercise, the more myofibrils you're going to make. The more actin and mycin, which are, tro which are proteins, the more you're going to make. Hormones can change, so guys have more muscle. Stress, stress.
stress can break down cortis cortisol, can break down everything. People that have a disease called Cushing's disease that have way too much uh, stress, too, too much cortisol in their body, uh, their adrenal glands are working overtime, putting out lots and lots of cortisol. Again, from a disease state, their muscles break down. So when you look at their belly, all their abdominal muscles are breaking down. So they're very toad bellied. So all their guts aren't being kept in place by uh, their abdominal obliques. Okay, the term hypertrophy means that you are making bigger muscles, hyper more. Atrophy, uh, this can be like maybe your arm's been in the cast, uh, so you're not using that muscle at all, so it's going to atrophy. But guess what? You can go do exercises when the cast is off, and you're going to plump up each and every one of those muscle cells again with some more actin and myosin. Old people, too. Remember, when we get old, we just don't do things like we used to. Protein synthesis doesn't happen as much as it used to, so um, your skeletal muscles, unless you're really working at it, I have an 85 year old uncle that still goes to the gym every day. He's handsome and he looks good. He's got a lot of muscle. Uh, but you know what? All of his buddies, they get skinny arms. Okay. Um, force of a contraction. So, how do we change the force of a contraction? Well, how often are we stimulating that muscle to contract? The more you stimulate it, the tenser that muscle's gonna get. How many muscle fibers are recruited? I'll get into that in just a minute. What's the size of your muscle fiber? Did, how big are, are you my Uncle Larry? Are you his friend? Uh, and then the degree of stretch. There is an ideal way to contract a muscle to get the best, the best muscle tension, the best force of that contraction. So let's go through recruitment. You have, um, actually no, we're gonna do motor units first. I have to explain those first, then I can explain recruitment. Okay. Some muscles, uh, well, a motor unit is that neuron and how many muscle fibers it innervates. So that neuron comes down and his little axon terminals splay out like, like, a, like a fan. So one neuron can go and touch maybe 10 muscle fibers, or maybe that one neuron can splay out and touch thousands of muscle fibers. When he can touch thousands, that's a large motor unit. That one neuron going to thousands of muscle fibers, it's a large motor unit. If it's that one neuron that's just going to like 10 muscle fibers, that's a small motor unit. The, the more detailed of a motion you need, the more uh, small motor units you're gonna have. So you can move your eyes in so many teeny tiny directions. You can move your fingers in so many different types of directions. But like your thighs, they don't do much. I can take that thigh and contract it and bring my knee straight, or I can relax it and make that knee go back, go back down. That's all he can do. He doesn't do all kinds of crazy stuff. Your quadriceps can't do all those tiny little movements that your eyes and your fingers can do. So I don't need anything fancy. I can have one neuron hit a thousand of my quadricep muscle fibers so that I can straighten out my knee. But your eyes and your fingers, because there's so many detailed motions that different little directions that your fingers can go, your eyes can go, then I need a motor unit that hits just maybe five. And then another neuron that hits maybe five. And then another neuron that hits maybe five. So that I can get those fine detail of, mo of motion. So this right here is showing a motor unit. This purple one will say, okay, it says it's motor unit number one. Here's that neuron, he splays out. He touches one, two cells. 
This guy right here, remember the cell body is inside the spinal cord. Axons leave the spinal cord and splays out. The axon is splaying out. He's touching three. So this is a larger motor unit than this guy. He's doing more than this guy. Hmm. I wonder where my slide was for recruitment. Maybe he's later. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right, this is going to, there is an ideal amount of overlap that is going to make the best strength of a contraction. So, if, let's say, actin is um, barely, how do I say this? This is always the most complicated part of the, of the, um, contraction strength. Okay, let's think about this. Okay, we've got a volleyball player and she's going to hit the ball. The ball is sure to come to her. If she is standing straight up, then her muscles are way too relaxed of a state to get good force when she that ball comes to her. If she is squatted down all the way where her hiney is touching her ankles, then her actin and myosin have been really pulled apart before she can straighten up. That's not going to get her a good contraction either to hit that ball. So if you can imagine a volleyball player, I say her, it could be guy, right? Um, if she is squatted at the perfect amount where her resting muscle length is 80 to 100% of a normal, complete, relaxing phase, then she is going to get the most power behind hitting that ball. So I hope that makes sense. If you're just standing there and the ball's coming to you, like when my daughter was eight years old and she decided she wanted to play volleyball and she watched the ball pass and she kind of hopped up in the air to hit the ball and it was like, that was not a very forceful hit. It's because she hadn't positioned herself properly. And then, of course, if you have the person that squatted all the way down with her high knee touching the heels of her, so she squatted so far down, she's too stretched out. So the actin and myosin are too stretched out. You won't get as strong of a contraction. So here we go. So this is showing, okay, right here. So let's do this. This would be excessively stretched. That actin is barely touching that myosin. This is the volleyball player whose butt is touching their heels. And they, you have to overcome all of this to get a hit. This would be that volleyball player that squatted down, knees slightly bent, uh, ready to straighten up those legs as soon as her arm hits that ball. And this is the one who is just hanging out. His life, we're good. Of course, I could come up with some other pathology. Um, you know, if your muscles are completely contracted because of a disease um, or they're completely stretched out, like maybe you tore your muscle right here so that the actin and myosin aren't even meeting. You tore your muscle. You've torn your muscle. The myosin heads aren't even next to. They can't even. The actin is here and the myosin is here. Oh, I can't reach you because you tore your muscle. Okay, um, I didn't see recruitment, so it's got to be in here. Okay, <laughs> we'll get there. Um, so, in order to understand the strength of a contraction, I have to show you what a single zap of a neuron to a uh, muscle cell looks like, and that's called a twitch. We've all had a twitch. You know that a twitch does not produce significant muscle activity, right? A twitch is just a, a twitch. So what it is, what I'm going to show you is to show you the strength of muscle contraction. So a single action potential causing a single muscle contraction and then it's over. You have a period where that action potential is running down the cell membrane and calcium is released, but it hasn't met the troponin yet. So the, that initial zap, the zap,
tossing the dominoes to the gates, open as dominoes, going down that T-tubule, going down and meeting the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and calcium is out. The calcium hasn't found the troponin. That's called the latent period. Something's happening, but the muscle's not contracting yet. The contraction period is when the calcium binds to the troponin. So the muscle goes, you start the power stroke. Myosin grabs actin, myosin grabs actin, myosin grabs actin. And then you have the relaxation period. My neuron says, okay, you can stop contracting now. So there is no zap anymore. So the calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and every, the myosin lets go and the contraction is stopped. So here is, this is an electrical graph. This is different from the action potential graph. Let me make sure that you understand that. This is, this is a different graph. This is measuring the tension of a muscle. How strong is that muscle contraction? Zap. So here we go, we're opening, opening, opening all these uh, channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, uh, sorry, the sarcolemma letting in some sodium and uh, goes down the T-tubules. And as it goes down the T-tubules, it finally finds the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That calcium is released and it starts meeting troponin. Meeting troponin, I'm contracting, I'm contracting, I'm contracting, I'm contracting. And then the brain says, that's enough. I don't need any more. Action potential is done. Action potential being done, that acetylcholinesterase starts eating the acetylcholine. Calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And uh, we're going to have more potassium resetting everything slowly. Potassium is slowly. We don't have any sodium coming back in, so we're going to go back down, relax that muscle. That's the relaxation phase. So look, here we go. Some muscles move quick, and they do lots of rapid, so your eyes, rapid eye movement. This, uh... This lateral rectus is talking about uh, for your eye. You can twitch that eye real fast. Strong contraction, quickly released. This guy, that single stimulus, he hits that same response. So these are different twitches for different muscles. Right here. Okay. We have different demands on different, for different needs. So what do I need to pick up? Uh, how fast do I need to get there? These kind of things. It's controlled by our nervous system. So um, you've met the twitch. Um, I'm gonna introduce to you how a muscle can get stronger based on um, nervous stimulation. So temporal summation, also called wave summation, is when you zap that muscle repeatedly. So like carrying the groceries. So you are getting the stimulus, hold the grocery bag, hold the grocery bag, hold the grocery bag. This is a repeat stimulus. This is an individual twitch, by the way. So, if this shows a single twitch, we're contracting, and then we're coming all the way back down to relaxation. Here we go, we're going to get a stimulus, we're going to contract, and we're going to relax. So those are twitches. Temporal summation. Here's the stimulus. You're going to contract. You're going to start to relax, but then you get another stimulus. Look what happens on that graph. The tension went up because you never got to completely relax. So you have all this calcium that didn't completely get pumped back in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You never completely relaxed. So you have this calcium from this stimulus, plus now we've got another stimulus. So we're adding more calcium to allow for more recruitment of more muscles. 
Another way to think of this is when you are exercising and you're doing reps. Let's say you're doing a barbell and you're doing 15 at a time. When you go up the first time, whew, that is easy. But let's do 30. <laughs> but 15 is probably not going to make anybody tired. You're getting to number 20 line. You're repeatedly stimulating that biceps and you haven't allowed time for relaxation for the calcium to get repumped in. You know by number 29, you've got the burn. You've got the burn and the tightness inside that muscle. That's temporal summation. Um, so the more you stimulate a muscle, the more rapid that stimulus, the tighter that tension is inside that muscle. Okay. This is same idea. Uh, let's go back to the grocery bag. Um, you could say this is getting to the point where, oh my gosh, can I lift it anymore? Can I lift it anymore? This would be like you're carrying the grocery bag and you're starting to get quivery muscles. Your brain says, don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it, don't drop it. And this is where you're like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> it's called unfused tetanus because you're still, uh, you're still having contraction, relax, contraction, relax, contraction, relax. You can get tetanus where you actually are flatlined. So that's complete tetanus like this. Um, say the end result is the same. You're done. You drop it. This is from an increase in frequency of a stimulus. Um, this doesn't happen very often. I guess I could say the weightlifter, the person that's competing and lifting the, I don't even know, 600 pounds, and he is holding it up in the air, and you can see him shaking, 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 shaking. He's going to get to a point of fused tetanus where his muscles are frozen and he completely drops it because it's a competitive mode. Um, again, this doesn't happen very often. Here's another example. Um, the person that goes and lifts a car off of a victim. Okay, we should not be able to lift cars, but we know that it can happen. So mind over matter. That would be a state where you actually could hit fused tetanus. The term tetanus from the infection, Clostridium tetani, comes from this physiologic uh, process where your muscles are tetanic. Those people are completely frozen up in a weird arched position. Their back is completely arched. Oh, you know, we can treat it if you catch it in time, but end stage, you are, you're locked in this almost sawhorse position. So it's just another idea where you wave summation, you, you can uh, build the tension in your muscle. And of course, if you do it with increased in frequency, you'll actually hit a tetanic state before you collapse. This would be more like exercising right here. But it's the same idea. Wave summation, uh, if you hold things and you relax, but you didn't let it relax all the way, it's the same idea. This one's just much more extreme. Another picture. Lift the barbell, relax, lift the barbell, relax, lift the barbell, lift it faster, lift it faster, lift it faster. Oh my gosh, go, 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 go. Ta da, you're frozen, you drop the barbell instead of gently putting it down. Oh, this can be pronounced so many different ways. I learned trepe, some people say treppy, some people say trap, but this is essentially warm ups. So before you exercise, you uh, maybe do some squats. So you go down on one leg or lunges, let's say lunges. You go down, you come back up. You relax. You go down, you come back up, and you relax. Warm ups, getting those muscles warm, truly warm, and for action. So you do allow a relaxation phase but as soon as you're relaxed, you re-stimulate and recontract. Look what's happening to the tension. 
You're increasing the tension inside that muscle. You're getting ready to run that 200 meter and win. We do this kind of stuff to, to prepare those muscles for that, uh, for that competition. There's the recruitment one. Okay, I was wondering where that guy was. So this also has to do with level of force, so I guess that makes sense. Um, you use your biceps to pick up your pin, let's say. You, you pick up your pin and you uh, bring your hand to your face and you rest your hand. You've got the pin in your hand. You picked it up and you, you brought it and now you're relaxing. You pick up a bowling ball and you bring it up to your face because you're preparing to throw, you're getting in position to, to, to throw that bowling ball. You're using the same motion, you're using the same muscle, but do you really need to recruit each and every one of those muscle fibers? No. The more you know in advance what you're picking up, the more your brain is going to recruit muscle fibers. So you're going to ask more mo motor units to come into play. Now here's the thing. Sometimes you, your brain subconsciously guesses how heavy something is. We've all done this. My daughter needs me to move her out of her dorm. I'm going to see a box. I'm thinking she's probably put as much crap in that box as she could possibly put. I go to pick up this box that my brain has already decided is going to be ridiculous. And I pick it up and it flies over my head and I fall down. Because there's nothing in it. Oh, I haven't packed yet. Okay, if you have teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. We've all tried to pick up something that ended up being a lot lighter than we planned on it being. So your brain recruited all kinds of muscle fibers that it didn't mean to. But usually, you know, your brain preconceives. How big is that cup? How big is that pen? How big is that? How, what, what do I need to pick up this object? Your brain recruits motor units. If it recruits all of the, so this is, here's a, here's a muscle, and here's all the, different uh, muscle cells inside of there. If I'm going to pick up a feather, here we go. But if I know that I'm going to be picking up a box of books, my brain is preconceived to use that entire muscle. All the motor units that I could possibly conjure up. Increasing, of course, the tension. Okay, muscle tone. We don't think about it, but we have non-moving muscles that are tense, that, that are fighting gravity all the time. So as I sit up straight in my chair, I have muscles in my back that are taking turns. They're taking turns, staying tense, fighting gravity. They don't do it all the time or else your back would get exhausted. You're not in charge of this. Your brain is recruiting this little bundle inside this little muscle that's running down my back. And now, okay, you relax. I need you to do your job. Moves to a different bundle of uh, muscle cells and says you need to keep recruiting. Uh, you need to keep contracting. You need to fight gravity. Okay, don't get too tired. Brain moves over to a different section, a different set of motor units to fight the gravity so that you don't go kaplunk with your head on the desk, whatever. So that's called resting tension. And you're not really in charge of it. Your brain is doing that for you. It recognizes, can you? Yes, can you tense up all the muscles in your back and be real strong? Can you slump your head down onto your desk? Of course, you can be in charge of that. But you do have a resting tension all the time that's fighting gravity, that your brain is making sure that your back doesn't get exhausted. So it recruits and relaxes different areas. This section is kind of cool. Um, muscle fiber types. Um, we have some 
that uh, use up a lot of oxygen. They're called slow oxidative. These are going to be for the marathon running. So this is one that can be the ones that are going to use um, uh, the mitochondria. So using the aerobic pathway. Going down to fast glycolytic. These guys are actually going to be pretty pale, low in myoglobin. They're just going to use more of the rapid pathway, so they're going to be using glycolysis to get some ATP. Not very efficient. They work fast. They get tired fast. And then fast oxidative is a good blend between the two. So it has to do with how they get their ATP. Um, we all have a mix of these. We all have all of these fibers. However, genetically, some of us, like uh, Usain Bolt, that man is fast, right? He used to be the fastest runner in the world. Um, I think he's been beaten. But, okay, so he's a fast dude. So chances are, if you biopsied his muscle, you'd find lots of this kind of muscle fiber and not nearly as many of this kind of muscle fiber. Again, most of us have a great blend of all of them, but genetically, some of us have more than others. So again, the slow oxidative is going to be pretty low intensity. So if you're just going for the nice jog in the morning, or shoot, I mean, just not doing much of anything, maybe you're just going for a walk, Something that you are going to use the mitochondria, the aerobic pathway, to make those muscles go. Um, anyway, I'm going to go through that again because um, I've already said it. Okay, slow oxidative are very resistant to fatigue. So that person that, person that can do a, a marathon, they can do it because they have slow to get those ATPs from that mitochondria, but uh, it's going to produce 95% ATP that our body needs. So really quick, we're going to have, um, I mean, sorry, for a long time, you're going to be able to go and go and go and go. Um, fast oxidative, again, is kind of a, a mix between the two. They're, they're fairly resistant to fatigue. I mean, you can overdo it and end up getting a big old buildup of lactic acid if you don't pace yourself. Um, these don't have as much myoglobin, so they're a little bit paler in color. I'm going to show you pictures in a minute. But the slow oxidative is higher in myoglobin, so it's they're very red. Um, and the fast oxidative have... Mm, they have some myoglobin, so they're not really red. They're a little bit more pink. Fast glycolytic is going to be, uh, it's going to fatigue fast. So um, they can get that really quick anaerobic two ATPs, but you start to get a buildup of lactic acid and you're going to wear out. They're low in myoglobin. So here's a picture. You can appreciate that some of these are darker right here. Some of these are lighter. Slow oxidative, uh, fast glycolytic, and this is a good mix between. This is a fast oxidative right there. Mr. Barton likes to talk about how, in um, maybe it's on that podcast, how um, uh, in Russia, I think he said in the 70s, they would biopsy people's muscles to figure out how should we train you for the Olympics because they want to win. So they would go and biopsy people's muscles and have a look at it and see, are you, are you loaded with slow oxidative? Are you loaded with fast glycolytic? Um, you know, what, what does it look like you're going to be best at? Is that not crazy? Sure, biopsy my muscle. Let's see where I should be trained at. Lots of information, probably too much. Hey, mitochondria-wise, which of those do you think would have the most mitochondria? Slow oxidative. Because we're going to use the aerobic pathway, slowly making ATP. So those fast glycolytic don't have as many mitochondria because we're 
we're not uh, worrying so much about the mitochondria. We're getting our ATP from the glycolysis, which is happening in the cytoplasm. I don't need the mitochondria for that, but it'll wear out fast. Very inefficient. I've already done these, actually. Hypertrophy, atrophy. Hypertrophy is plumping up that muscle with um, actin and myosin. And atrophy is when you start to lose actin and myosin. The proteins start to go away. Now, you can make more if you exercise. But, um, you know, like if you had your arm in a cast, they're, the actin and myosin are going to start to go away. They have a life. Um, but uh, you can build them back up if you exercise. More protein synthesis, actin and myosin are proteins. So is troponin, so is tropomyosin. All right, so endurance exercise. This would be the marathon running, swimming, biking. So things that are not immediately quickly stressful. They're, they're building up uh, muscle. Um, you're using the aerobic pathway. And if you're making more proteins inside that muscle cell, you need to support it. So you actually, the more you build up, you actually are going to branch off from your existing capillaries, more capillaries. So you're going to continue to create more blood supply. That's called angiogenesis. Resistance exercises would be like the resistance bands um, or weightlifting, things like that. This is usually going to be an anaerobic pathway, so glycolytic pathway. That's why you get the burn in your muscle. It's not that you don't get a burn in your muscle if you do aerobic, right? But um, not as much as if you've done all the heavy weightlifting. Because the heavy weightlifting is using the glycolytic pathway, so anaerobic pathway, same thing aerobic, glycolytic, and uh, you're going to build up some lactic acid. When you do this, I think I mentioned in bones, uh, not only are you working on your muscle, but you're also building your bones because remember you get those tiny little micro fractures from resistance uh, workouts and you get those little cracks and so they'll polish off the old bone that has the crack and lay down fresh new bone which is going to strengthen your bone. We should do resistance exercises starting at a young age so that when we're old, we're healthier. Um, disuse atrophy. So that's the cast. Or if you've been laid up in bed from some, some sort of reason. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. Um, so every day that you don't use a muscle, you can actually lose 5% of your strength. Um, Paralyzed muscles, if you've seen someone that's paralyzed in the legs, their legs are going to be really skinny. What will end up happening is you'll have connective tissue eventually replacing the lost muscle. And that's it. Once the connective tissue replaces muscle, then uh, you, you, you've lost a muscle cell. Muscle cell dies, fills in with connective tissue. You don't have, there is no mitosis in skeletal muscle. So as soon as, this is why physical therapy is so important. As soon as something happens to somebody, as soon as they're physically able, they throw in physical therapy so you don't lose those muscles. The older we get, the less mitosis we can do. This is atrophy, atrophy specifically from age. It's called sarcopenia. So you just, you just don't do protein synthesis like you used to. So you can't plump up those muscle cells that you have as well with actin and myosin. Now, if you have been exercising all your life and you've done a good job of maintaining that, that healthy program, then you're definitely going to be, a like my uncle, a much better looking man at 85 than any of his peers. Woohoo! Moving on to cardiac muscle. Because I've already mentioned a lot of this stuff, so we're almost done, y'all. Okay, um, these guys are not the super long muscle. It's 
cell, like the skeletal muscle with all the nuclei. These are shorter. They usually have a branch. Well, they do have branches. There's going to be one to two nuclei. They do still have stripes because they still have actin and myosin laid down parallel. Uh, so still has the, have those sarcomeres like that. Of course, you need lots of oxygen to make your heart go. So cardiac muscle cells are loaded with mito mitochondria. And they still have myoglobin too, just in case we need that emergency oxygen. Only uses the aerobic pathway. Does not use the anaerobic pathway. And they're branched with intercalated discs. And I've mentioned already, the intercalated discs have the desmosomes that are like the zippers to make sure that those cells don't come apart. That would be bad if our heart muscle cells disconnected from each other. Also inside those intercalated discs, besides the desmosomes, are gap junctions to make sure that that electricity can pass through each and every cell as a wave so that your heart can go lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. We need that zap to get through every muscle cell as quick as possible so that that heart squeezes and relaxes as one. That's called in sync or in succession. We need that entire tissue to go lub dub, contract, relax, contract, relax. The electricity that makes the zap is actually special cells inside the heart. That's called autorhythmicity, which means that that heart is in charge of its own electricity. I should unhighlight that. I'm not going to make y'all spell that out. Anyway, you have these little pacemaker cells. They're in an area called the SA node, also the AV node. They create the electricity and they make the heart beat. You can change the rate of the heart beat by um, your autonomic nervous system. So you can make it faster, you can make it slower. But um, uh, what's actually creating the zap, what's actually creating the action potential, are these special little pacemaker cells. Uh, a heart cannot go into tetany. I probably should just go ahead and take this slide out because this is a little bit more AMP2. But um, we cannot, we, because of the way the action potential is for the heart, um, you can't get into that frozen state where your heart uh, freezes up and then um, uh, relaxes, you know, just completely goes into fatigue. Uh, it's a different pattern. So here is a heart muscle cell. Here's a cell. Here's a branching. Here's a branching. Here's a nucleus. Um, and then we have those little pink lines that was on the microscopic slide. That's the intercalated discs. And inside that intercalated discs, there's going to be some desmosomes and there's going to be some gap junctions. Smooth muscle. See? Wasn't that easy? <laughs> okay. Smooth muscle is going to be in places that there's a hollow center. So something that has a lumen. The intestines, uh, you know, there's a center that your food passes through. Your bronchi, there's a center that your air passes through. Your blood vessels, there's a center that your blood passes through. You get the idea. There's a couple of other areas too, like inside your eye. Your iris is smooth muscle, so you can uh, change the shape of your pupil. You actually have um, a ciliary muscle that's changing the shape of your lens. Uh, but it's everywhere. You know, if you have asthma, then you have had uh, bronchoconstriction. The smooth muscle inside your bronchi have constricted, which has closed the airway to a much smaller airway, and it makes it harder to get oxygen down to the little air sacs called alveoli, where that simple, uh, simple squamous is. The urinary system. Um, we have ureters that are bringing the urine from the kidney down to the bladder. It's not by gravity that 
the urine that was made by the kidney goes to the bladder because sometimes you lay down. So that would be bad if you pooled inside your ureter. You have smooth muscle inside your ureter that's propelling. It's like pulsing like an inchworm to get that urine down into the bladder. Of course, the uterus, that smooth muscle, you're not in charge of that, getting that baby out. Well, you are, but you don't get to decide when you go into labor. Your uterus decides that. That's all smooth muscle. Oh, and your skin. Your skin, you have the erector pili muscle that makes you have goosebumps. So there's that smooth muscle that's attached to the hair follicle. When it contracts, it makes the hair stand up. He's spindle shaped and he has one nucleus. And then again, his little actin and myosins are set up more like a chain link fence. Um, he's a lot smaller than the skeletal muscle. He still has endometrium around the cell. That's it. Um, no transverse tubules. Probably a little bit too much, too much information on this slide. Um, he's the weirdo that can go through mitosis. So skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle doesn't go through mitosis. Um, I mentioned at the beginning they get their source of calcium uh, sometimes differently in the bed. Um, instead of having Z discs, those actin and myosins link to something called a dense body. So I'm going to skip almost all of this. I'm going to take the picture. Okay. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that they're lined up like in a, as a chain link fence. Instead of having a Z-disc anchoring the actin, it's something called a dense body. So whenever this cell contracts, it's more of a corkscrew type contraction. Instead of going from long to short, it's, it's, squeezing, uh, it's squeezing itself in almost like a ring type pattern. So this still will bring the actin towards the middle, the actin towards the middle, but since it's going in all sorts of little directions, it's almost uh, squeezing a sponge. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes the calcium isn't coming directly from the endoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes it comes from the outside. The reason that smooth muscle doesn't get tired as much, or at least you hope it doesn't, your, you know, your intestines are continuously moving like an inchworm. Instead of that myosin having to grab a hold of that actin every time and then pulling it and then letting go, he actually has a little latch, just like your screen door. You can latch your screen door. The myosin has a little latch that can grab a hold of the actin and now he doesn't need to use any more ATP. He is attached for a long time, and that lets that contraction go and release and go and release, and I don't need any more ATP to make that myosin let go of that actin. So smooth muscle is fatigue resistance because he can latch on. Nah. Now, I think I said this earlier with the skeletal muscle. Satellite cells can do repair. You can't do mitosis for most of your muscle cells, but satellite cells are always around. They're like a stem cell, that is, they are a stem cell that can repair damage. But unfortunately, if it's damaged enough, it's not going to be muscle tissue anymore. It's gonna fill it in with connective tissue, and that's scarring, and that's called fibrosis. In smooth muscle, we have another cell called a parasite that um, can repair smooth muscle. So we can do repair, but um, with most, most of the time, muscle, just once that cell is damaged, he's done. And then when we're in lab, you're going to learn about muscles that uh, produce a movement. There's going to be a main guy that produces movement, and then there's going to be somebody that opposes, that does the opposite. So your biceps and your triceps are antagonists. Your biceps are going to flex your elbow and your triceps extend your elbow. So they're antagonistic to each other.
Um, a synergist is somebody that kind of helps. So uh, on the back of your calf, you have a gastrocnemius, and underneath it, you have a soleus. So those muscles actually work together. They're going to contract and help bring your heel up. Um, so they help each other. They're synergists to each other. And lever systems. So I told you that bones are leverage for movement because a muscle is the guy that does the contraction and actually does the moving. But a lever, a lever system, we have different kinds of levers, and you probably learned that in high school or maybe even middle school, the different classes of levers. So I'm going to go through those real quick. You have a fulcrum, which is what is staying still. It's wherever the lever rests. You have something creating resistance. So maybe what are you picking up? What, where is the gravity fighting? And uh, then you're going to have an effort. So in anatomy and physiology, the muscle is the guy that's going to bring up the effort. So here's a class one uh, lever. So in the real world, just maybe in middle school, whatever, you've met the scissors. So the effort would be your muscles is closing up this part right here of the scissors resistance what is what are you cutting are you cutting a piece of paper or are you trying to cut a one inch twig and then this part is the part that's staying still so this is the constant right here on uh in the body right here um maybe you have this splenius muscle right here that's contracting you're fighting gravity you're bringing your chin up, this muscle is contracting, your fulcrum is going to be where your uh, spinal cord meets the skull, you're resisting gravity, this contracts, and so there's the effort right there, and so your head tilts up. Second class lever. The fulcrum, the steady point, is um, going to be right on the edge, so a wheelbarrow is a good example where the um, wheel is the fulcrum. That's the part that's not moving. That's the steady part. Resistance, what are you what are you moving? What's your load right here? And then the effort would be where you pick up the wheelbarrow right here. So this part is going up resisting resistance is what are you lifting? In the body, here's an example of a second class lever. So your toes planted firmly on the ground, what are you resisting? You're resisting gravity as you take, go up for a walk. The effort is the contraction of that gastrocnemius, of that soleus. Look, they're both attaching to the calcaneus. That's one of the two tarsal bones you need to know. So there's the calcaneus. The other one is the talus that the tibia is sitting on. And then finally, there's the third class lever. So um, the fulcrum is going to be uh, on an end right here. So this is using the tweezers. You squeeze the tweezers and the resistance is, what are you tweezing? Are you tweezing just a hair? Or are you trying to uh, tweeze out, I don't know, let's do the... Let's do the one centimeter stick off of your child's leg, whatever. It's going to be a little bit a little bit harder of a pinch that you'll have to do to get a hold of it compared to the eyebrow. Okay, so in this case, uh, maybe we are, maybe we are um, hand wrestling, what do you call this, arm wrestling. So you've got your elbow rested on the table. The resistance is the other person's hand. Look where that biceps comes and attaches to the radius. So the effort is that contraction of that muscle right there, trying to win that, uh, that whatever that's called, arm wrestling. Some videos to watch. And remember, please, also on Lanyap, I have each and every one of those step-by-step uh, -step videos for the physiology, the molecular level of contraction, where you're looking at 
the calcium coming into the end of the neuron. When calcium comes into the end of the neuron, the acetylcholine exocytoses out of the neuron. The acetylcholine goes through the synaptic cleft. It goes and finds the ligand-gated receptor. When the acetylcholine binds to that, to that receptor, the gates open. Acetylcholine doesn't go in. That's not his job. Acetylcholine's job was just to open up the gate. Sodium rushes in from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Sodium rushes into that cell. And now that negative 70 is being bombarded by all those sodiums. If you zap it hard enough, then you're creating an action potential to propagate down that sarcolemma, down the T-tubule, where it's going to meet the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. He gets the message, I am being zapped. I am getting a message. I receive the action potential that tells me to release my calcium. The sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium. Now it's floating around free in the cell. He finds a troponin molecule. The calcium binds to the troponin molecule. When stuff binds to stuff, it changes shape. The shape change makes the uh, tro tropomyosin, the thread part, move off of the binding sites of actin, the little beads. Now myosin can grab a hold of that actin and pull on it. Thanks to ATP, the breakdown of ATP, it pulls on it towards the center and it's gonna keep doing that power stroke until the contraction is complete and your brain says, that's enough contracting, thank you very much. When you quit getting the zap, that calcium gets pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that the calcium is no longer bound to the troponin, which makes the tropomyosin cover up the binding sites again. So, tropomy uh, so myosin can't grab a hold of the actin anymore. And then of course, what makes that myosin move back and forth? ATP. When ATP binds to myosin, it makes that myosin go down back into the cocked position breaks apart the ATP into ADP and phosphorus, storing the energy into that myosin head until another uh, action potential or another, uh, or the continuation of actin being available where he can grab it again. If you're dead, you don't have any ATP. So the myosin can't let go. What makes ATP, what makes myosin head let go is the attachment of ATP. You're dead, you don't have ATP, so all of your myosin stays stuck onto the actin in the contracted position, so you get stiff. Why do you loosen up over several hours, 36 hours or so? It's because your body starts to decay. And that's that. You let go of the myosin and actin let go because they're dissolving into smaller molecules. All right, I hope that's helpful. I wish we didn't have to do that, but you know what? It's going to be a great resource. All right. Y'all have a good day.